water projects and it became a foundation. I volunteered for the last 17 years and last January I started working for the foundation as a project manager. So I handle a lot of the sort of facilitation of projects. I'm going to Burkina Faso, Togo, and Uganda in about a week to do a lot of the site visits. So I'll be away for three months. And yeah, it's been a part of my life. And I can tell you guys a story of how I got started and everything. Or we can talk about sustainability, uh, about empowerment, about peace to being successful, peace to failing a lot, and then being successful. So uh, yeah, just uh, tell me what you guys want to talk about. It's, it's all good. Yeah, what about both? Yeah. Yeah, okay, so. Talk about second, That's good. So if you guys don't mind, I'll give a short presentation of what I do, and then we go from there. Actually, it looks like we're going to more. No. No. Está pegada la caja. So hey guys, uh, for those of you who just came, my name's Ryan. I've been involved in volunteer work for the last 17 years. I'm part of an organization that's 14 years old that brings clean water to places in the world. And I'd like to start by telling you guys the story of how I got involved and how I kept staying involved and how it became part of my life. So when I was a kid, I was in my grade one class. It was a long, long time ago. Mm -hmm. and So it was a long time ago, and I grew up in a place called Kempville, Ontario. So it's a small town in Canada, kind of isolated, kind of just regular mill Canadian town, and life was really simple for me. I went to school, I didn't get my parents too angry, I did as little work as I possibly could in class just to get by, and I played soccer at recess. And that was it, that was my life. So it was simple and it was easy, and I remember we used to do annual charity projects at my school every year. So when I was in kindergarten, we did like a can food drive, and we raised money for cancer. It was just part of the routine. We did something every year. And we got to grade one, and my grade one teacher uh, said, this year we're raising money for developing countries, for things that kids your age don't have. So we were surprised. We're like, what do you mean the world's bigger than Kentville? Like, that's weird. <laughs> Uh, so my teacher explained to us, yes, the world's bigger, not everyone is as lucky as you guys, so here's a list of things we're going to save for. And it was a thing like, things like, one son was going to buy a pencil, two dogs was going to buy a blanket, five dogs buy five home lunches, and so on and so on. And she got to the point on the list where she said $70 to buy a well, and then she explained to us in one sentence that kids our age couldn't go to school and were dying because they didn't have clean water. And we would have been six and seven years old, so we didn't understand we're like, what do you mean? Why don't they just go to the water fountain? Duh. Problem <laughs> solved. <laughs> and so my teacher had to explain to us, like, children we were, that no, not everyone has water fountains. Sometimes kids your age have to walk five kilometers to get clean water. We were six, so we didn't know how far five kilometers was. So my teacher 
teacher explained it to us by saying 5,000 steps. That didn't help at all, because I couldn't count that high. Okay. I remember I counted the steps it took me to get from my classroom to the water fountain. And I counted 10. And when I was going through kindergarten, it was just one of those concepts that was just forced and stressed upon us was this concept of sharing, this concept of justice, that if things weren't fair or equal, your parent or your teacher or someone who was you know, bigger would do their best to make it so. And all of a sudden we were told that that wasn't the case, that the world wasn't sharing. And so a few of us were a little bit ticked off with our teacher, but uh, my teacher shrugged and said, you know what, if you want to do something, save some for something on this list. So we were deciding who was going to fundraise money for what, and the wall came up. And I raised my hand. I didn't raise my hand ever. So my teacher was really surprised and raised an eyebrow and said, are you sure, Ryan? This is a big part of our fundraiser, and if you can't do it, it's going to suck. So I said, don't worry. I've got a plan. I'm going to go home to my parents. I'm going to ask them for $70. <laughs> They're going to give it to me. And I'm going to come back and give it to you. And I thought it was a great plan. My parents would obviously see how virtuous and such a good person I was being, and they'd probably pat me on the head and thank me and then give me the money. And I'd give it to my teacher, and that would be that. No one would have to die from no more clean water. So I thought it was foolproof, but I went home to my folks, and they basically tilted their, head, tilted their heads and said, aw, oh, that's cute, but no, <laughs> and ignored me. And I remember I was really stubborn about it. I remember I pestered them about it for days and days and days, and then uh, it got to the point where we were having like a Sunday family dinner. And uh, my mother, she used to have this thing, she hated it when we pointed. She thought it was like the most rude thing a person could possibly do. So I remember we were having this nice family dinner, and I pointed right at my mom. I was like, you don't get it. Someone just died because they don't have clean water, and you didn't help them. So I got a timeout. But, <laughs> but my folks, they, they sat me down afterwards, and they were like, you know, around $70, that would be like 700 pesos, I guess. And it's a lot of money, especially for someone who's you know, a child, you're six years old, like, you don't have an understanding of money yet, but we're not going to just give you the money, but if you're serious about it, you can do extra chores on top of the chores you already do, and then you can do something magical called an allowance, and then you can, if you're serious about it, you can save that money up and use it for this well. So I already had to do things like I had to make my bed, clear the table, walk the dog, and now I was told I had to do things like wash windows, vacuum, shovel snow all these different things I didn't have to do before. And at the end of the week, uh, my folks would give me a couple dollars. So I started doing that, and it was uh, I went to a Catholic school, actually. So it was a Lenten project, and it was only supposed to last for 40 days. And by the time 40 days had gone by, I had raised a total of about $25. So I failed, and my teacher was a little bit disappointed. And uh, But I decided, you know, I had this idea in my mind, I was still sick, so I thought if I could get to $70, it would buy one well, and everyone in the world would have clean water. So I thought, I'll just keep on going, it's just a little bit further. So I kept on doing chores and saving up money, and it took me four months, but I finally raised $70. And yeah, there's me telling the story, my awesome handwriting. Yeah, so I brought it into an organization in Ottawa that built clean water wells. So I got the day off of school, I got all of that stuff to me. <laughs> and I was excited, I was going to build a well. So I brought this cooking tent and I brought it to them. This is to build a well, and they kind of did the same thing my folks did when I came home with the idea. They tilted their heads and said, aw, oh, that's adorable, <coughs> but it's going to cost a lot more than $70 to build a well kit. It's going to cost at least $2,000. So I told them I'd just do more chores. My maths was still very subpar. Uh, so I went home and I started doing more chores and I realized that my folks weren't giving me any more money and it was going to be a long haul. So I started doing a, a few things for my neighbors and then I went back to my classroom, uh, my classroom and I thought, well, this is such a good cause and it's only a little bit further. If I get other people to give me money, then I'll have more money. So I said to my friends, you know, you should give money. And they said no. Uh, you know, I worked hard for my allowance, and I want it. Uh, so I remember I had to be a little bit creative, and I went out and I... Uh, that's, uh, you guys know what Pokemon cards are? Yes. I went out and I, This is when Pokemon cards first came out, so I went and I bought like 10 packs of Pokemons, and I had like a school raffle fundraiser. And it was a success, because that's what people are interested in. And that's what uh, I was able to bridge the gap and get my friends interested through the magic of Pokemon cards. And... Uh, 
So I did a fundraiser and it was a little bit successful. So my teacher said, hey, why don't you give a presentation to the class? So I didn't want to, but I figured if I did, maybe someone else would get involved. So I did, and then another grade one teacher from the other class said, why don't you give a presentation to my students? So I did, and then I guess my first official speech was when I was seven, I spoke to the Kentville Rotary Club, so 50, 60 year old Rotarians, servicemen, and here when I was a kid, I was seven. Uh, did anyone go to speech therapy when they were a kid? I went to speech therapy, and uh, I couldn't pronounce my words, I couldn't pronounce the THs, so thunder, I'd say thunder. And I stuttered like a madman, it's not easy to understand me. But uh, I went, and the words, they may not have gotten across, but the message did. Here was this kid, there wasn't anything really special about me, who wanted to make this difference. So I was able to get my neighbors involved, my family, my friends, and my peers, and eventually it got to the point one year later, where I was actually able to raise the $2,000, and it went towards the completion of a well at Angola Primary School in northern Uganda, in sub-Saharan Africa, and the school there got the first water source that it ever had, and it was cool, actually. The school enrollment actually jumped from 700 to 1,400 students just because the well was put in, and it was great, uh, but I was growing up a little bit. I would have been seven, almost 13 age, and I realized that one well wasn't going to actually be enough, and the problem was a lot more complicated, so I decided it's probably just one more well to keep on hunting. So, uh, it actually got to the point when I was nine. But how did that happen? You just send the money there? Well, I was originally cool. doing a fundraising for my school. And then uh, when I raised the $70, it took me four months, and my school wouldn't take the money anymore. So I went into an organization called Water Camp in, in Ottawa that built clean water works. And I brought them the money, and they said, it's going to cost a lot more to do a minimal project. It's going to cost at least $2,000. So I did fundraising for, it took me about a year and a few months, and I raised the $2,000. And I was able to set up a meeting with their on-the-ground local partner, who would have been CPAR, Canadian Physicians for Aid and Relief. And I had a meeting with them when I was seven to, <laughs> to figure out where the bubble's going. And I had a little bit of pull. They asked me, okay, we're doing a lot of work in Uganda or Ethiopia. Where do you want the well? I had no idea the difference, so I said Uganda. And then they asked if I wanted the well in a village or a school. And I said I wanted it in a school because in my mind I wanted kids to be able to go to school. So with that, I got put in the old primary school. And then uh, it was really cool actually when I was nine. Right? Yeah. Oh, it was slides. Anyway. When I was nine, uh, I was actually able to go to Uganda to see the well that was going. My neighbors, they traveled a lot for a living, and they were able to give my folks air mile points for Christmas one year. So I was actually able to go and see the well. And I remember there was this huge celebration. I was there. there was 5,000 people, everyone from the surrounding community showed up, and there was this festival and a feast, and everyone was just so just pumped, so excited, so happy because we had clean water. And I don't have a smile that lights up on my face because I can have a shower in the morning. So it just helped me put what I needed to be happy in perspective. And then it got uh, a little bit bigger. We were able to get more people involved, more people from my community, from the surrounding community. It was able to get some national media attention. And we were able to expand it to the point where we were actually able to create our own foundation. And 14 years ago, we created Ryan's Well, and we've been able to do 927 water projects and wells in 16 countries. It's helped over 800,000 people. So it's been a very crazy How journey. Are you I would have been 11. So, oh wait, no, 10. 10 turned into 11. So, I, well, I was doing a lot of speeches and a lot of speeches at school, and community groups, and service groups, and I was able to convince people hey, become part of my project. So on our county board, there was about nine people. We had a teacher from my original school. We had a, I was able to sweet talk a lawyer into joining. And uh, uh, my friend's dad was a hydrologist who we got to be a part of our board. And a few other people from our community we were able to get towards because we figured we had a, we had a momentum. We had a story that you know people were gravitating to. We were able to get a lot of work done. So we thought that it was best to harness it. So we created the Ryan's Well Foundation, and we're 14 years old now. We've been able to do a lot of good work from that. So, yeah. How do you build the well? Do you like get donations? Or? Well, how we build them is we work with our local partners on the ground. We've worked with them over the last 14 years, so we've been able to develop really good partnerships. So we'll start by doing a small project and make sure that all the uh, 
criteria that's in place and then do a bigger project if that's able to be successful. So it's a better matter of giving people the tools and fundraising and the capacity they need to basically be sustainable. So in Uganda, for instance, our two partners right now are Divine Water in Uganda, which is operates in the north and they used to operate on a whole bunch of different funding that's been scaled back in recent years. So we're one of their only supporters now and they're able to do good work in a lot of rural areas. And work with a women's collective called RWF yet and it's essentially a group of eight widows that built their own collective and has been able to do a lot of good work uh, with them as well. So we work with eight partners in six countries at the moment. So we work in Uganda, Kenya, Burkina Faso, Togo, Ghana, and we do some work in Haiti. So yeah, so that's what we do at Ryan as well. It's come a long way because when I was six it was a failed grade one school project, but the fact that I was stubborn and naive enough to think that I could make a difference. Like I thought that one well was gonna bring the entire world clean water. I did not understand the problem. Like we were listening to Ken talk the other day, there's still almost one billion people in this world that don't have clean water. And it's a huge, staggering problem. And it's something that a six-year-old isn't going to understand. But the fact that I thought that I could make a difference and I was stubborn enough to think that I actually could, and it ended up making a big difference at the end of the day. So I think that's good to show you that you don't necessarily have to be an expert to become involved with something. You have to be naive. The hardest thing I've had to do in the last 17 years was raise my hand in my classroom. I did not want to raise my hand. I wanted to go home and play video games. But the fact that I was able to step outside of my comfort zone and do that small thing ended up to get a lot of work done. So sometimes you have to realize that you can't rob yourself of the opportunity if something is your passion about. And as you were growing up and you had so much work to do, did you ever think of giving up or like, oh, I want to hang out and not have to do visit and have well, many speeches? And well, I was really conflicted when I was a kid. And actually, Ken was talking to us about this little, uh, the idea of the, the other day. I went to a Catholic school, so we read the Bible and looked at people like saints, that Jesus character, all these selfless people that you know gave their lives to causes. So we were kids, so we liked superheroes. If we're talking about favorite superheroes, my favorite superhero is Batman. And just all these incredible people who gave themselves to causes and didn't care about themselves and were remarkable. And I envy those people. I'm, you know, I stare at and wow those people. But I'm not one of those people. I like to go home and sleep on the weekends and play sports and hang out with my friends. And I thought that the world was comprised of two people. There was the people who were activists and go out in the world and made a difference and everyone else who stood home on the couch. And I think throughout well, my volunteerism is that I realized that the people who actually do make an impact aren't the crazy, selfless people. Those people are amazing, but at the end of the day, if you're able to establish a people that, you know, it's okay to be self-interested and care about yourself, but to give back and volunteer in one way or another is how we built Ryan as well. It wasn't a team of superheroes, it was a team of ordinary Canadians and then people around the world. Pardon? I mean, you end up being a hero because this is where you have I am. The thing about Ryan as well is it's the story of a kid who was able to make a difference. I don't think that's confined to me as being a hero, it's confined to the fact that ordinary people don't have to wear a cape and be above everyone else to do that. Yeah. Um, and when you were growing up, is it like a non-profitable organization? Yep, right? we're in a registered NGO of charitable status in Canada, and we've been able to do, do work with lots of work teams. That's nice. Yeah. I was going to say, um, I was in Ottawa. Hey! In fourth grade, a friend of mine actually did a project on me. Ah! Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so just to give you a story of how this can affect someone's life, when I was in grade two, uh, my grade two teacher heard about what happened in grade one and said, oh, this is a really cool project, but why don't we expand on this and get uh, pen pals, get writing buddies, because we were learning how to write at the school where the wall was built. 
So we all got writing buddies, and my writing buddy ended up to be this kid named Jimmy through a very, very long, complicated story and ended up becoming my brother. But uh, I'll say that. Uh, but uh, Jimmy went to the school before and after the well was built. Before the well was built, Jimmy used to have to get water for his family and used to have to get up really early in the morning. Does anyone want to guess what time Jimmy got up at? Graham, two? Four. Midnight. Jimmy used to have to get up at midnight, and he had two big jerry cans, and it was actually uh, about six kilometers for him, because there wasn't a well in his village or at his school, and he had to walk six kilometers to the nearest well, fill him up, and then come back, and then do it again, and then do it one more time. And then I like it when uh, Jimmy tells a story, because then he would say, then I would have the privilege to go to school. Wow. When I was a kid, I didn't think that going to school was a privilege, something your parents made you do. But the fact when the well was put in, he was able to go to school at a reasonable hour and bring the water home at the end of the day and not have to fall asleep in class changed his life. And he was able to actually get an education. And I think that's something that uh, you know we can underestimate a lot. So, yeah, a question to ask you guys is what am I passionate about? When I was a kid, I just so happened, when I walked to when I walked to the water fountain, it just clicked in my mind. It was something that I didn't think was fair, and there was something I had to do about it. And I think there's, whether it's water, or obviously you guys are all here for a reason. There's been things you know, that you care about. And if you can find those things and not let them you know, glance over your head, and you can do something small, even if it's a naive action at first, who knows what it could turn into. And I guess another thing when I was growing up and doing a lot of volunteer work is I heard a lot, especially when I was a kid, I was doing a lot of presentations and speeches and fundraisers to other kids at schools. And a lot of what I heard is, you know, I'm only a kid, I'm eight, nine, 11 years old, like I have to wait until I grow up a little bit. No one listens to me and I don't have any power. So I'll wait till I'm a teenager and then I'll do something. Like, but now I'm just a kid, I can only do so much. So it's like, okay. And then when I became a teenager, it was like, oh, well, I have to worry about school and my friends, and I have so much going on, and it's such a busy life, and I can't worry about this, and I'll wait till I'm an adult, an adult to do something. Okay, and then when you become an adult, it's rinse and repeat. It's I have to worry about a job, and a family, this, that. And uh, basically, there, I learned that there's a lot of different ways that you can find excuses in your life not to do something. And you're always going to be busy to the point where you're gonna find excuses not to get back, but if you find a way to do it and you're naive enough to try, then who knows? So I guess the story I wanna leave you off with the official presentation at least is a story that I heard when I was eight years old. I went on a television show called Galloping Gourmet. Is anyone ever heard of it? Yeah. <laughs> it's like a really, uh, it's like a very show. Like a Price is Right type thing. But, uh, it was a cooking show, and this uh, British guy used to run it. His name is Graham Kerr. And I went on the show, which was awesome because I got free food. But before <laughs> I went on the show, he sat me down and gave me this picture, and then he told me a story. He said, Ryan, in life, everyone has a cup and a saucer. So, like, teacup, tea saucer kind of thing. And he explained to me that after much of his life, his cup was overflowing into a saucer. And he told me that he poured what he didn't need in the saucer back into his cup until what he realized that it made him happier to pour it into someone else's cup. So it's a simple way of saying, if you have more than what you need, you give back and you share with others. I think the tricky thing about this is it's really easy in life to not realize when your cup is overflowing. You lose perspective of what you need to actually be happy, and you simply don't realize that your cup is overflowing. So for me anyway, to take a step back every once in a while and have the perspective of saying, I'm lucky enough to have clean water that comes from the tap outside this room and someone else doesn't have that. And if you remind yourself and take your perspective, step back every once in a while, then you can learn to get back a little bit more. Yeah, so that's the official presentation. So are there any other burning questions or comments or discussion? Yep. How did you do correct this time to your brother? Yeah. Uh, well, Jimmy was my pen pal when I was in grade two. And uh, we wrote to each other for a few years. Then I met him when I went to Uganda to see the well. And I attended the school there for two weeks. And we became good friends, uh, probably best friends. And uh, I actually learned then that he was actually an orphan. He was being raised by his aunt. But he was there and he was fine. So it was like, see you later, Jimmy. <laughs> and I went back to Canada and I kept on doing fundraising. I kept on writing to Jimmy. And uh, it got to the point, and it would have been 2000, 
2001 it would have been now, where there was a lot of conflict that came into Jimmy's uh, region with uh, something called the LRA, the Lord's Resistance oh, yeah. Army. Yeah, so this was a long, long time ago, like not even recently, so I'd say. It would have been 2001, and the rebels were basically gaining ground and uh, becoming a lot more violent, and they operate by abducting child soldiers. So it got to the point where Jimmy's village was raided, and he was abducted along with lots of other kids in his village. And while they were leading him and his, basically his extended family off into the bush, uh, he chewed through the ropes that were tying his hands up, and he ran off while they were shooting at him. And he slept in the bush that night, and he came back to his village the next day, and everything had been burned down. And the people that were left blamed Jimmy for them burning down the village because he ran away, saying, if you did not run away, they wouldn't have burned down the entire village. This is all your fault. You're no longer welcome here. So he would have been, he just turned 13 at the time. So, you know, it's a lot to digest for a 13-year-old to not be welcome in your own village. So... We heard about this all at once two weeks later through a contact of ours who was doing water projects in a different area. <coughs> and we realized that we, in Uganda, you have to pay for your schooling after grade seven. So we were sending a couple of dollars for these education, but we realized as a family uh, we were meant to do more. <coughs> so after a very crazy month, uh, Jimmy was able to actually come to Canada on a visitor's visa to attend a conference. And we found out more about what actually happened he wasn't safe to go back, so he became refugee status in Canada, and he became my brother. So that would have been a long time ago. He would have came in grade seven, and uh, he's all grown up now, 25 years old. He got married last spring. I was the best man at his wedding, so he's come a long way. So it's a crazy story, but it's got a happy ending. Yeah. Who are your best friends? Uh, well, I was the best man at his wedding, so I like him. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, I've been a volunteer for the last 17 years, and I actually only started to work for Ryan as well as a project manager in January, so the last two months, so it's very new for me, but uh, I've done lots of different jobs over the years. I was a delivery truck driver for three years. I worked for a group in Ottawa. I've done lots of different stuff, and I've always just volunteered for Ryan as well up until now, which is weird. <laughs> Aren't you like the CEO of Ryan as well? I am the founder, <laughs> yeah. so uh, the only spe special privilege I have actually is I'm an ex officio board member, so they can never kick me off the board, mm -hmm. but I also don't get to vote at board meetings, I just have to give my opinion. So uh, the good thing about Ryan's well is it became a, less and less my project and more of a community. The only reason why I was able to be successful is I was able to convince people to come along and be a part of it. People who were more knowledgeable th than me, especially when I was a kid. I didn't have the expertise to make sustainable projects that lasted a long time. I needed people who knew about that. So it was a matter of making a community of that. And now, fortunately, I'm able to pitch in and be a part of it. Mm -hmm. fixes 
water problem, so that's what we have a big focus on. Yeah. Could you just like explain the concept of sustainability? Well, sustainability is making sure our project is lasting, and the best thing you can do is to help people take ownership of a well. If you are an organization, let's say a water organization, and you go somewhere and you drill a well and you don't have any community involvement, you know, it's very involvement from the community, then they'll use the well once it's put in, but it, it will break, and they will say, oh, it's not my well. You know, we go back to dirty water sources, go back to water, and that will be that. So it's a matter of getting people involved in the process of the building of the well and teach them how to fix it if it breaks. And it's a lot of extra training that you have to put in, and you have to invest in the local community, but it becomes worth it to get people who are invested. This is our well, and we're going to maintain it and protect it. So, you know, it goes with anything, you know, help people help themselves kind of thing. So it's a process, but it's very worthwhile. And where do you get the money, like, to build the world? Well, the last 14 years, we operate on all the donations, so we made a pretty good go of it so far, so a lot of our donations come from schools, a lot of elementary schools. There was a mm. documentary and the Oprah show and the Reader's Digest article and stuff that made basically waves of attention for the foundation, so we were able to harness it a little bit, and uh, we try our best to preach that out, and then we get a lot of funding from schools, we get a lot of funding from individuals, I guess our top countries would be from Canada, the United States, Australia, a little bit from Europe. From Brazil for some reason, <laughs> and uh, but, uh, we try to, but companies don't like to give money away that often, especially to something that's an international water NGO. You know, it's a little bit harder to do. So a lot of our, I'd say about 65% of our funding actually comes from individuals who hear about the work and want to support it. So a lot of donations. Yeah. And maybe famous people. Famous people. Uh, let's see. The most famous person that I can think of that we've done work with is uh, Matt Damon, who's have an organization called uh, H2O Africa, and we did a matching uh, donations campaign with him about so it's been like five years ago now, so we were able to raise a little bit of money off that, and a few people here and there. Uh, that's the first time I've actually heard of Water's Life when I came here, so we haven't done any work with them. We work with mainly local on-the-ground water NGOs mm -hmm. that are in where the projects are being done, and we're operating as a classic to go straight to them, so not particularly early, no. Yeah, awesome stuff, guys. So thank you so much for coming today.